Hallelujah. Well, you have your Bible? Uh, you know, the, the Easter, what you call the Easter story or the story of the death, burial, and resurrection is found in Matthew. It's found in Mark. It's found in Luke. And it's also found in the book of John. Paul talks about it in his writings. And uh, the prophets prophesied about it. The prophets prophesied about it. But I want to take a text that uh, it's not where I'm going to stay, but I'm going to take a text this morning that I think I just just fell in my heart. I changed it during, uh, during some of the worship. And I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Yeah. Some of you are already in Matthew. I know you already had me. You thought you had me figured out. And, and uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, let me just start at verse one. I had verse four marked. Start at verse one. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our face from him. He was a spies and we did not esteem him. Surely he, that man, who are we talking about here? Jesus. Surely he, that man, Jesus, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. You know, when it all comes down to it, this is what the prophet was going to prophesy. The truth is, uh, Angel mentioned this morning in uh, uh, the class that she had in the, the teachers, and we were talking about it last night. He bore our sorrow, carried our shame. And, and we were talking about it last evening, getting ready for bed, and, and how he not only bore the wounds and bore the stripes, but he, he hung on that cross completely naked. What a shameful thing. Everything he did is shame. He hung there. He, he bore our sorrow. He carried our shame. Everything that we could ever encounter, Jesus took it upon himself. I, I don't know how. Uh, there's no way to describe it. Years ago when the movie came out uh, about the, um, the passion of the Christ, there's no way Hollywood, as good as Hollywood is, no way anybody could uh, depict exactly what Jesus went through. He was almost filleted alive. And uh, there's no way to depict that in human. And the person that's actually going to go through it lives with, with that. And so, uh, but he did. He carried our sorrow. And yet we, I want to read that again. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded. Say with me. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, say, I am, I am, I am healed. Glory to God. We are. And we're going to come to this table. And this table is not going to be just a religious thing because it's going to depict everything that we just read. The stripes upon his back. The blood that was shed. And then we find that in all three chapters, the book of Matthew chapter 16, the book of Mark chapter 14, the book of Luke chapter 22, and the book of John starting in verse 13, going away to the verse, uh, chapter eight, 13, going away to chapter 18. We find these stories that we so love and, um, and dear. So the thing that I want to deal with and talk about today before we come to this table is uh, Jesus, a man that was forsaken and alone forsaken and alone. My heart was going out is today, so many different people will be here today. Uh, this morning, I knew there's going to be people that has walked with God, has been born again for decades and decades and decades. Uh, people has been saved for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And then there's people here that's been born again and just saved a few years and maybe some just getting saved. And then we may have people here as I'm praying that, that once accepted Jesus Christ, but yet went back 
to the world and follow after things of the world. Or maybe those may be here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I know there's a possibility of those that are here. I met a man that was, uh, that pastored for uh, 28 years in one community. Met with him, talked with him. I've, I've broke bread at the table. And in those 28 years, uh, just because he wanted to change professions as in a pastor, he was in a businessman, thought he'd be a pastor, went to a, uh, a seminary and never did know and understand all the way through his pastor what it was to be born again. It was just going through the just going through the rules and going through the process and uh, a good man, uh, good morals. But the truth is good men and good morals still go to hell. The only thing that keeps you out of hell is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, years ago, uh, my, uh, my little brother called me and I've just, uh, he's not here today. Uh, but my, my little brother called me during the time of the Passion of the Christ. Actually, I was, Angel and I were preaching in a meeting over in Indiana, uh, Bath, Indiana over there, and, and it just came out. And, and so at that time, my brother had not been born again uh, during that time. And so uh, my mom called me and says, your brother's trying to get a hold of you. So I called him, and, and he went to see that movie, and he was so bothered in his heart of what happened and and he says uh, I've, I've got to quit this I got to quit that I, I, I'm going to go to hell if I don't quit this if I don't quit this if I don't quit that I said Mike it's not drinking it's not smoking it's not the cussing it's not all that it sends you to hell why people go to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior you can quit all of that and still not have eternal life but thank God one day he understood what eternal life was amen and so you, you got to understand it's not by works it's not by what you do you're never going to be good enough in yourself you can't dress good enough you can't talk good enough it's not something that we earn it's something that's bestowed upon us he who knew no sin Jesus became sin that I might become not earn not by that I might be made that I might be made transformed into the righteousness of God and that's what it's all about and so Today, if you don't allow this to get old, I think it holds life to you. I was talking to my friend, Kenny Gatlin. I shared again this morning. I think I mentioned it Wednesday. I talked to him and I said, what are you up to, Kenny? And he says, well, just finishing up my sermon, to, you know, getting him out of the tomb. And I'm thinking, you know, there's only so many stories that tells how he was resurrected. And uh, there's only so many creative ways to tell it. So it's not all about the transmitter. A lot's got to do with the receiver on how we receive on what's going on for decades and decades. Uh, you know, I've been preaching this gospel for 38 years and I can't find stories I've never heard. I can't find stories I've never heard. So we have to allow the word of God to become life to us on a daily basis. Amen. So based upon the scriptures, he was wounded, he was bruised. Let me lay a scenery. Uh, according to the book of Matthew chapter 26, the book of Mark chapter 14, and the book of Luke chapter 22, you'll find the same story. I, I broke it down. I took us on a journey on Wednesday. I'm not going to take us the whole journey, but there's one journey I'm going to take. The day, the weekend that Jesus says, he sent his disciples, says, you go prepare the Passover for me. You'll go to a certain place, you'll find a man. You'll say to him, the master wants to have Passover in your upper room. And he'll know exactly, and he'll do exactly what it is. And as Jesus spoke, that's the way it was. In this upper room, it was having Passover. And there Jesus spoke with him and shared with him. And that's the place. And one of them, that's where after dinner, he washed the disciples' feet and showed them that you don't have to murmur and complain. It's not about who's the greatest. It's about who's the servant of all. And that's what the story was. But to skip all that happened, I broke down all what happened at upper room in the book of John from chapter 13 to chapter 18, all the things that Jesus did, the prayer he prayed over his disciples from that upper room. But the point was they left that upper room and they went to this place called Gethsemane. This was the garden. This is where he prayed. And so he was in that upper room in the Jerusalem area and he came down out of that upper room. And while they were in that upper room, it was Passover. They were killing lambs, sacrificing lambs. History shows that there was approximately 
250,000 lambs being sacrificed because the lamb must be slain. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin at all. Without the blood being shed, there's no forgiveness of sin. And every year they had to do this because the blood of bulls and goats and lambs only temporarily covered the sin of mankind. They had to keep coming back. The day that he walked out of that upper room and they were heading to that garden, passing by what was taking place down that hill to the Kidron Valley, over the Kidron Brook. And at the base of it, there was the Garden of Gethsemane sitting right there where he began to pray. As he could hear and see the people offering sacrifices because of the Passover, knowing that all of those lambs being slain, that that night he would be captured and he would be the ultimate lamb, the ultimate sacrifice given his life. 250,000 lambs that night could not do what he was going to do within 24 hours. So when you understand what he did when he saw that, and knowing that, all of those lambs, it's going to take me, it's going to take my obedience. I'm going to have to go to this cross. They don't understand what's going on. And he went into that garden, and he bowed his knee, and he prayed the only prayer he knows. God, if there's any other way this could pass from me, maybe... If there's any other way, one of those 250,000 lambs could do the job. Let it be done. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I still get emotionally touched because the few years ago, I mentioned this Wednesday, the few years ago that we came down a Mount of Olives and when I was on that Holy Land tour. He came down the Mount of Olives. Jesus came down from Jerusalem in the other direction. We came down the Mount of Olives. At the base of that mount, which they call the Palm Sunday Road, at the base of that hill to the right was that garden. And we went in to pray. And I'm sitting there thinking, what, what do you pray in, in Israel when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane? There's only one prayer to pray as I found me an olive tree. And I knelt down and cried out to my God. It doesn't matter what I've done up to this point. The truth is, from now to the end, not my will, but thy will be done. It's the only thing that we can pray. So now we find Jesus in the garden. We find Jesus in the garden. During dinner time, Judas Iscariot was revealed. He was revealed to be the one that was going to betray him. He left to go set the deal up. Jesus was there in the garden. And this is where I want to pick up some things. So I want you to go, we'll just keep it simple. Let's just go to the book of Matthew. Uh, instead of me quoting from all of these other places, let's just go to Matthew and uh, 26. And let's just look at this together. Matthew 26. Let's just look at verse 36. And he came... Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and greatly distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Watch with me. What was he saying? Stay here and pray with me. I know you don't understand what's going on, but this is the most crucial time of my life and your life. This is about my obedience in your future. He said, watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face, fell on his face, fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it, pos if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not, not as I will, but as you will. He came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Found them sleeping. I explained on Wednesday why I thought they were sleeping. I don't want to go into that story. You can go back and listen to it. And, uh, but he came to them and found them sleeping. Now, I want to bring a point out here. And said, Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter, to, enter, to, enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter, you know, we just had this conversation in the upper room about, do you love me? I already said before the rooster crows at night, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, prayer is important. Again, the second time he went away and he prayed saying, oh, my father, 
If this cup cannot pass from me, nevertheless, I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. He left, he let them, he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still sleeping? Are you still sleeping? And resting, behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, arise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, once you look at this, at his greatest need, he was alone. At his greatest need, he was alone. You know, I know what it is to feel lonely in a room full of people. I know what it is to go through something when you've got a room full of people around you and people talking with you and you feel all alone. Everything in you feels empty. Everything in you feels like what's going on in life. You're disconnected a little bit. Mental, just mental troubles and anguish and, and uh, just, just life by itself. And Jesus facing his greatest hour and his closest men that he's invested his life into, one of them is already selling him out. He has 11 with him, and he takes three of the closest confidants. And he says, he takes him a little further and says, you watch with me. Please watch with me. And he's over there pouring his heart out, beating this thing, making sure that everything is right in complete compliance and obedience with God. And his people were asleep on him. All alone. All alone. I've heard pastors say, sometimes I feel like I'm in this all by myself. Who's, I feel like I got people, but, but they're not really there to help me. They're, they're there physically, but their heart's not there. And just because people there are physically doesn't mean that you perceive them to be there with you. You're with you. That's just like someone says, are we together? Well, I'm standing right here, but are we together? That's what he's saying. They were with him, but they were not with him. He was all alone. He was all alone. So folks, let me tell you, when you feel like you're all alone and nobody cares, he started off being alone because he does care. The reason why you don't have to be alone and feel sorrowful and filled with grief is because he was willing to walk it alone. And there was another human being there with him. He was willing to walk it alone. So we find him in the garden. Should me going up and read it? Look at it. Let me just narrate it. They find him in the garden. His betrayer comes. This is where Peter pulls out the sword and cuts off Malchus's ear, the high priest servant's ear. But when all that was said and done, different author gives a different story, but it all comes down to this one thing. And when they detained him and took him, the Bible says the others fled. They fled. The same people said, I'll be here with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And they said, we'll never leave you either. We're gonna be here, but... They fled. He was standing there with his enemy. What? All alone. All alone. A man that, was, that carried grief and sorrow and shame. He was there all alone again. Taken before his accusers, his accusers, those people that accused him, those people that hated him, those people that saw him as their enemy, but he never saw them as his enemy because he knew exactly what he was up against. They wanted to kill him because he threatened their system and because he was the enemy to them, but his love was so great, he never saw them as an enemy to himself. That's what I tell people. Just because you see, just because somebody sees you as their enemy doesn't mean that you have to see them back as your enemy. Amen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not our enemy. So even though they perceived him as their enemy, they perceived him as the one who was, who was uh, challenging their system and, and all of their, their hierarchy situations. He never saw them as his enemy. Why? Because no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life. For God so loved the world, I'm going to go through this. I'm not doing this because you look at me as your friend. Even though you look at me as your enemy, I still, I still, I love, love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. God is love. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was God walking on the earth. So I've read it like this many times. For God so loved the, so loved the world that God gave himself that God so loved, God is love, God so loved the world that love was willing to die on the cross. Love was willing to take the stripes upon his back. Love was willing to allow his blood to be poured out. Love was willing to stand alone in the garden. Love was willing to stand alone in the garden when they came to capture him. And love was willing to walk through this for you when they plucked his beard and they beat him and they mocked him. Eventually, the shame, the shame that it was a part of it. And there, Peter was looking from afar, and people were saying, you, you were with him. Uh, no, I wasn't. Yeah, you are. You, 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 you're a Galilean. No, I'm not. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we saw you. No, it says he cursed to prove. Mark's gospel is the best at this. Other says that when the cock crew. Peter knew and he went out wept bitterly. But Mark put it this way, that the last time he said, I know him not, apparently he was close enough. It says, and Jesus looked at him, mano, mano. What do you think those eyes look like that day? After he had the conversation in the upper room, before he ascended down and saw all the lambs and down through the brook and went into the garden and, and knew that he was going to do. And Peter said, I won't, I'll die with you. And all of a sudden he denied him just as Jesus said. And the Bible says Jesus looked at him. Other places says he went out wet wept bitterly, but they don't put it in there. And Jesus looked at him. I think the reason why he went out wept bitterly is because when he looked into them eyes of love, he didn't go do what Judas did. He went out and made a commitment. It doesn't matter what happens from this point on. I will never, ever, 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 ever go back on my God again. That's why when it came to picking one man to leave out the religious traditions of going amongst the Gentiles, he chose a man who made a commitment outside of the town that day. And he says, Peter will never say no to me again. <laughs> Peter will never say no. Why? Because he remembers looking into my eyes. He remembers. See, once you look into the face of Jesus, you'll never forget him. Once you look into the heart of God, you'll never forget that love. You may wander off and you may do things, but let me tell you, your heart will never, ever forget the love of God. Your heart will never forget his eyes. Your heart will never forget his compassion. Your heart will never forget how he reached out to you, how he healed your babies, how he saved your life, and how he rescued you. You'll never forget that. One look into the heart of God will change your life forever. One look into the heart of God will change your life. It will take the hardest heart and make it as soft as can be. One look into the heart of God can do that. I find Jesus then as now they have tried him. False accusations, false accusations. Until they finally get him to say, are you the son of God? And he says, you, if, he says, you've said right. And they stripped their clothes and said, what else accusations do we need? What other testimonies do we need? You know, and, uh, but Pilate knew on that day, knew on that day that uh, he, he that's not worthy of this death. But the religious leader said, crucify him. He was alone in the garden while he was praying. He was alone in Pilate's hall, judgment hall, because they fled. And now we find this Jesus beat, beat beyond recognition. I was in a group of preachers back in the first week of March, and one of them prayed over communion and said something that I've, I've said and I've prayed it myself in one aspect but something hit me so hard that day. I mean, I just almost went like that. Dear God. He's praying over that communion cup and he says, Father, I thank you for Jesus. Jesus, I don't know exactly word for word now, but then he said this, you did not spill your blood. To spill it would be an accident. Sorry, I spilt my soda. Sorry, I spilt my coffee. He said, your blood was not spilt. That would be accidental. You poured your blood out. I said, oh my God, there was nothing accidental about this. It wasn't spilt. He was poured out. He was poured out. 
he was poured out. He was a, he was a, he poured himself out. Glory to God. It wasn't just spilt. He was poured out. And, uh, and now we find him led to the cross, led to the cross. And it's amazing as I titled this forsaken and alone. It's amazing that on the cross, when everything was said and done, hung between two thieves, it's not just a, it's not just a statement of two thieves. One of them, he said, the day you'll be with me in paradise, the other one mocked him. The, the other one mocked him. It's not just where he was at with two thieves. It was what happened. We know the earthquakes, the graves opened. We know the darkness. But that's not what it was about. Something else happened on that day that forever set our destiny. Right before he died, he cried out. And he said, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? It's not enough that my men wouldn't pray with me in that garden. It's not enough that they fled when they came and got me. I was all alone. But this is almost more than it should be. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he took his last breath. And the Bible said he died. He gave up the ghost. Why was that last prayer important? With all the sin that he carried up on him, God turned away. Couldn't look upon him anymore. It was when that was that separation of knowing that you are the ultimate sacrifice. Everything is laid up on you now. But it has to be done so that I can raise you up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. God was willing to allow one son to die so he could resurrect many sons and daughters as we are here today celebrating what we call Easter morning. <laughs> Forsaken and alone. Wounded, bruised, Forsaken, shame. Whoever, they say whoever laughs first will laugh last. The devil laughed first. He laughed first then, but he's laughing last now, amen? Because we have the victory. We have the victory. You have a living hope, and his name is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, amen? Amen. He went through it alone so you didn't have to. He became sick so you could be healed. He became sin so you could live victorious. There's so many angles to look at this. Today, I just wanted to narrate this so you could have your heart touch that he went through this for me. He went through this for me. Amen.